Okay, I think we are live. Can we in the chat just confirm for me quickly that you can see me, that you can hear me, that you can see hopefully this. Oh, you can't see the slideshow quite yet. Give me a second to get the slideshow set up and then just let me know in the chat. In the meantime, can you see me and can you hear me? Thanks so much for your patience. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. I ran into a very funny, <laughs> very funny situation where I was opening up our Zoom um, behind our presentation. And so I could not see that it was opening and I was wondering what was broken. <laughs> Turns out nothing was broken. I just don't know how to use a dual monitor setup. So <laughs> welcome to our webinar. My name is Erica. Thanks so much for waiting a whole four minutes <laughs> for me to arrive. Um, welcome. So today in our live class, we are doing SAT lesson one, which is test strategy and reading passages. Now, if you're going, why is this lesson one? That's because this is the first in a series that we do um, for our Magoosh students. Um, now, this first lesson covers test strategy, so how to deal with the test kind of at a higher level, how to deal with the timing, how to deal with um, your study schedule, how to use strategies in order to get the most points, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the first half of this class. And then the second half of this class is going to be on reading passages. So what are the best strategies for attacking these passages so we don't run out of time and so that we're prepared to answer the questions? Going ahead and jumping in. So as hopefully you know at this point, hi, I'm Erica. Um, I'm the SAT ACT Senior Curriculum Manager here at Magoosh. Um, and what that means is that I am um, the person who thinks about our lessons and our questions and our explanations and thinks about the best way to present those things to students. So thinks about what are the best strategies for the majority of our students? What things are gonna help students get through these problems the fastest? If a student has a limited study timeline, what are the things that they should focus on? What are the things that are gonna give them the most points that they're gonna be able to get fastest? Those sorts of things. So that's what I do. Um, it also means that I have written the curriculum for these live classes. So the one that you're gonna see today, I wrote that. So if you've got any feedback, let me know, um, as well as the other lessons in this series. So it's an eight lesson series. You're getting lesson one today. Um, I wrote the other ones as well. Now, over the years, I have taught and written materials for more than 10 different standardized tests, which is a lot. So standardized tests are kind of my life, um, but the SAT and the ACT are the ones that I started with. They are my favorites and I keep coming back to them. Um, I live in Seattle, Washington, where it is currently very hot. It is going to be um, over 100 degrees this weekend, which is something that I am not physically mentally or emotionally prepared for. <laughs> so um, I live in Seattle. I'm used to the gray. I'm used to the rain. Um, and I live here with my husband and my two cats. You can see them on the screen. That's Roz. That's Mel. They are the loves of my life. I'm seeing Sean in the chat. Hey, Sean. Um, Sean is in one of our life classes right now. And Sean actually won a raffle for one of our free life class cohorts, which I'm going to talk more about in a second because we got another one of those today. All right, let's talk about our goals first. So goals, we are going to review SAT structure, timing and scoring. So if you haven't taken the test before, this is maybe going to be some new and really important information. If you have taken the test before, some of this might be a little bit of review, but that's okay because we're going to use that information to learn test taking strategies that you may not know in order to get the most points with the time that you have and with the structure that this test has. We are going to discuss how to study effectively. So how to study effectively if you are self-studying. So if this live class is the only thing you do with Magoosh, how are you gonna study effectively? But also how to study effectively if you have the Magoosh online program or if you have Magoosh live classes or if you have some other sort of prep system, we're gonna talk about how to do that the best way possible. And then we're going to introduce passage strategy for SAT reading, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier, but basically how to get through these passages in a reasonable amount of time and be prepared for the sorts of questions that you're going to be asked about. And what we're not going to get into is question strategy because 
that's actually something that in our larger course we get into in lesson three. So we just don't have time for that today. Um, um, we have some videos on our YouTube channel about that, that I'll shout out when we get there and you can ask me questions about that at the end. But I do wanna show you the live class structure that this lesson is from. So it's an eight lesson series. So each lesson is two hours. It's 16 hours in total, which is a lot of instruction. And we cover the reading section, the writing section, and a ton of math. So um, if you like what you see today and you're interested in more, you might be interested in our live classes um, where we get more into a lot of these topics. We do reading questions, so building on what we learned today, and then we get into the other sections as well. So lesson one, you're getting for free today. Now, I mentioned that we're going to do a live class raffle, which we'll talk about in a second. But one other thing that we are doing today is giving out a 20% live classes discount code. So if you like today's lesson, you want more, you're interested, we have this 20% discount code, which is pretty big. <laughs> we don't do 20% a lot. Um, and it is live 2021. So I'll pop this up later throughout the um, lesson today. And if you are interested in using this, um, this is something that you can just go to our website and get for either SAT or ACT. And that's for the whole course, lessons one through eight, 16 lessons. Wow. Okay. So SAT structure and timing, actually, Rewind. <laughs> so we are going to do a live classes raffle. I mentioned that just a second ago. Um, we're going to do that at the end of the lesson. So if you can stick around until the end, you have a chance to win. It's going to be just a random selection from whoever is still here. Um, and if you win, you get to come to our classes for free. Sean can tell you in the chat that they're pretty cool. <laughs> so if you uh, want to stick around, you get a chance to win. All right, now let's get started. So we're gonna start with SAT structure and timing. And first in the chat, I wanna ask you a question. Who here has either taken the test before or has taken a full length practice test? So yes in the chat if you have, no in the chat if you have not. Let me know. Oh, and we got a poll, oh. Kian is so on it. Maybe answer in the poll <laughs> or you can answer in the chat. Either one. Okay. I'm seeing that folks here are for the most part pretty prepared and PSAT counts. It's close enough. <laughs> Okay, I'm seeing that yes is more popular than no, but we have a good a good contingent of, of no's in here. Um, so folks who have not taken this. So if you have taken this, this is going to be a little bit of review, but we're going to take it into strategy. If you haven't, pay attention. All right. So SAT structure and timing. So the SAT is always going to start with the reading section. Um, hot tip that's not on the slides. Um, the reading section is really hard to do cold. So if you roll out of bed and immediately go to the testing center, um, you're probably going to struggle with this section <laughs> um, because it takes a little bit of brain power to read. And I find a lot of students who um, don't put in the effort before their exam on, in the morning, they end up um, with their brain still booting up during the first passage. They go slow, they miss questions, and they end up kind of like mentally and emotionally um, messing with themselves for the rest of the exam. So hot tip before your test, read something. Um, this can be a textbook from your school. It can be like a, not the whole thing, but like a, a, a bit of it. Um, it can be an article, like something in the New Yorker. It can be um, like some sort of vaguely academic text. And all that's gonna do is just wake up your brain, get you more prepared so that you can hit the ground running. Sidetrack, but jumping back in, reading section. So this is always first. It is 65 minutes and 52 questions. If you are writing this down furiously and trying to memorize it, don't. I'm going to give you better numbers in a minute. The writing section is going to come after the reading section. So this is also going to be based on passages, but rather than being a section like reading where you read a passage and then you're answering questions about the passage, do you understand it? Um, the writing section has a little bit of that, but it's more going to be about grammar and understanding if the way the author has written is going to be most effective for communicating their goal. 
So the writing section is going to be 35 minutes and 44 questions. Note that that is more questions than minutes. So that one goes pretty fast. After the writing section, we have math, no calculators. There are two math sections on the SAT. One has a calculator, one doesn't. No calculator, I think pretty obviously, is the one that doesn't. So the no calculator section is pretty short. It's 25 minutes and 20 questions. Um, most of those questions are going to be multiple choice, but there are going to be some grid in questions at the end where you have to kind of bubble in uh, the numbers and decimals and whatever of your answer choice. We'll talk about those in a second. And then we have our math calculator section, which is 55 minutes and 38 questions. Um, so this one, you have a calculator. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, 58 minutes, 38 questions. Um, so more minutes than questions, but this is still moving at a pretty quick pace. Now I have on my slide that you have 50 minutes for the one essay in the essay section. However, the essay section is no more. Um, there is the smallest chance that you will possibly be taking the essay, and that is if you are taking the test in your school as part of something that your state requires, then you might see the essay. But if you are taking the test on a Saturday, um, or in most cases, if you're taking it with your school, you are probably not going to see this essay. So that is outdated. <laughs> so you only need to think about the first four bullets here. Now, let's really quickly answer another question in the chat. Um, so quick question. Who here struggles with timing on the SAT? And that can be either you don't finish a section or you have to guess. Or maybe you go like way too fast and then you're like, oh no, I missed a bunch of questions and you have to go back through it. Um, and it could just be for a single section. Maybe you're totally fine on reading and writing, but on math, you get in trouble. And you can answer this one in the poll as well or in the chat. Do you struggle with timing on the SAT? <laughs> Okay, I'm seeing a lot of me's. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, this is tough. Um, and I'm seeing in the poll, we got 87% yes right now. Now, if you are one of those uh, mythical people who does not struggle at all with timing on the SAT, congratulations. That is amazing. Um, but most people do struggle with timing somewhere on this exam, um, maybe not in all the sections, but in, in some of them, which means that our timing is going to be really, really important. Um, now, there's a lot of different ways that people try to deal with their timing strategy on the SAT. Um, so the first one is not looking at the clock <laughs> at all. <laughs> Just going, I'm going to go fast. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Um, but then they don't look at the clock at all. Um, or maybe they look at the clock like randomly. Now, this is this is trouble, right? That, that pretty obviously is not going to be the best solution because we have no idea how we're doing, right? So that can get us in the situation where we're like way behind. And then we look at the clock and we're going, oh, no, I have no time to catch up. And so then maybe we did really well on the first chunk, um, but we went slower than we should have, right? Maybe we took a lot of time with questions we were just going to miss anyway, right? Um, oh, I'm seeing one. I look at the clock and get panicked. Yeah, okay, right? So the, the clock can be kind of stressful. Some people ignore it because of that. It's not the best strategy. So that often ends with folks not finishing the section or having to like work really quickly or guess toward the end which is not the best, right? Um, the other thing that we can do here is instead look at the clock all the time. Um, so some folks will use these numbers here to come up with these really awful per question checkpoints, right? And they'll go, okay, so for writing, I have about 46 seconds per question, which means when I finish a writing question, I'm going to look at the clock and I should be about 46 seconds in. So that means for the next one, I should be another 46 seconds in. So adding that up and they end up in this awful situation where they're checking the clock all the time for these awful checkpoints. And they end up wasting a ton of time just looking at the clock. So that's really bad. But another thing that's really not so great about that is that if we're checking the clock for every single question, we end up not having um, flexibility for questions that take longer and questions that take shorter because 
yeah, some math questions are going to take exactly the amount of time they should take, but some are going to take like a couple minutes. Some are going to take like 10 seconds, right? So it doesn't really accommodate that. It also doesn't accommodate passages. So in reading, we got to read, right? How does that fit into our question checkpoints? Unclear. So, okay, it's bad to not look at the clock, but it's also bad to look at the clock way too much. So what do we do? How do we split the difference? And that's going to lead me to the first test taking strategy of the day, which is to use multi-question timing checkpoints. So instead of avoiding the clock <laughs> and getting into trouble because we're not looking or looking at the clock so much that it wastes our time and doesn't give us any flexibility, we're going to set a predetermined number of questions or passages um, that then we get to look at the clock after. And then we will have a preset amount of time for that amount of questions. So we know if we look at the clock at that point and we are on target, we're gold. If we're a little behind, okay, now we need to speed up. And the way these checkpoints are set are so that if we're a little behind, we're only a little behind. We're hopefully not so behind that we can't dig ourselves out of that hole like we do sometimes when we don't look up the clock, right? So these multi-check question timing checkpoints allow us to have flexibility between questions, but kind of at a larger scale, keep us on track and give us enough time to adjust throughout the section. Okay, now you might be going, but what are they? Let's find out. So going back to reading. So reading is 65 minutes per 52 questions. And if you're trying to do math here, divide 65 by 52 or 52 by 65, don't do that because reading gives us something really nice, which is the fact that those questions are broken between five passages. Now they're broken relatively evenly, 10 to 11 questions each. Um, and you'll notice that this is gonna be much nicer math. 65 divided by five, gives us 13 minutes per passage. So I saw in the chat, I use around 10 minutes per passage. You can actually give yourself longer on reading. You can give yourself 13 minutes per passage. And that is going to be the exact right amount of time to finish the question or to finish the section. So if you are doing the reading clock, you should be about 13 minutes in. Do clock, you should be about 26 minutes in. Do another one, look at the clock. You should be about 39 minutes in and so on or so forth and so forth. <laughs> so that's the reading section. Really quickly in the chat, give me a face to indicate if we understand what's going on. So you can give me a smiley face if you're like, yes, I get it. Let's do the other ones. Sideways face if you're like, I'm not really sure. I'm going to need some more clarification. Frowny face if you're like, I am completely lost. I do not understand what you're talking about. <laughs> Start over <laughs> in the chat. And that can be just an emoticon, an emoji, whatever. Let me know how we're feeling. <laughs> cool. Okay, for the most part, it seems like we get it. Awesome. And if you're going, I need a little clarification. Let's talk about these other sections. Okay, so writing. Um, writing is also going to be passage based. It's a little bit different in our approach because it has different types of questions, but it's still based on passages. So instead of doing 35 minutes per 44 questions, we're going to think of that as 35 minutes per four passages because there are four passages and each passage has 11 questions. All right. So if we've got 35 minutes per four passages, it doesn't divide perfectly, but it divides to about nine minutes per passage. Cool. So on the writing section, you got a little bit less time per passage. You're going to do the first passage. Look at the clock. Should be about nine minutes in. Do the next one. About nine minutes. Look at the clock. Okay. Um, oh, I've got a really great question in the chat. So does that mean the 13 minutes for each passage? Does that include reading and the questions? Yes, it does. We'll come back to that idea um, in the second half of our lesson um, about reading, but really great question, Iris. So for reading, it's 13 minutes to get through the passage and the questions. For writing, it's nine minutes to get through the passage and the questions. And we got the same question in the chat from Grace. Yes. Cool, okay, so that's writing. Moving on to math. So on the math section, we do not have passages to guide us. Unfortunate, right? Um, 
So what we're instead going to do is we're going to break them into a chunk of questions, right? Not too few, because then variability is going to get in our way. Not too many, because then we can get way too far behind. So what we're going to do is we're going to break it into eight questions. And each of those eight questions is going to take 10 minutes. Kind of easy to remember, right? 10 minutes, very easy to see on the clock. All right. So on math, once you finish the eighth question, you should be about 10 minutes in. Once you finish the 16th question, you should be about 20 minutes in, and then you should not have too many more questions. <laughs> so that's the whole deal with math. 10 minutes, eight questions. Now on the calculator section, the timing is slightly different. Again, we're going to break it into about 10 minute chunks. This time you're going to have seven questions in 10 minutes. So that means you have a little bit more time um, for each of those questions, which is nice. But again, 10 minute chunks. So seven questions in should be 10 minutes in, 14 questions in, should be 20 minutes in, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then we're just gonna skip the essay because it's not relevant to you. Okay, now these are the numbers from the first four bullets that I would like you to memorize. These are the ones that I want to be like rock solid. You have these so that you can apply these no problem on test day. So if you want to take a screenshot, now's a great time. We're also going to have this um, live stream posted on our channel as a recording later. Um, but this is a really useful strategy. Okay, so now that we have these numbers, let's figure out, okay, what do, how do I apply them, right? How do I actually use them? So let's talk tips for using these multi-question timing checkpoints. If you are off track when you get to a checkpoint, adjust your pace. So if you are right on 13 minutes per passage, cool, keep doing what you're doing because clearly you're doing something right. Okay, if you're 15 minutes for a passage, 16 minutes for a passage, okay, maybe something is not quite going right. It means we're going too slow. If we keep going at this pace, we are not going to finish the section or we're gonna have to speed up and guess, all right? So if you are off track, adjust your pace. If you are under time, Maybe we just keep going the way we're going, but we're also going to give ourselves the freedom to slow down a little bit because <laughs> we have the flexibility. Now, that said, when I say off track, I mean significantly off track. Give yourself a one to two minute buffer. So what does that mean, one to two minute buffer? It means if you are a minute off track, the passage took you 14 minutes. That's nothing. It doesn't matter. Those sorts of things just kind of come out in the wash. So don't worry yourself too much. If you are a little bit off pace, not a big deal. Now, if you get to the next checkpoint and you're more off pace, okay, now you can adjust. But these are guidelines. <laughs> they don't have to be followed to the T. Okay. Know how to adjust checkpoints. All right. Now, if you follow the checkpoints exactly how I laid them out on the previous slide, you will be great. You will do an awesome job on this test. You will finish all the sections. Hooray. Um, but you can make these checkpoints a little bit different in order to make them more accurate to you and to this test. What do I mean? Let's take the math section. The math section has a pretty set difficulty in that the test makers try to make the math get more difficult through the section. So as we go through the multiple choice and no calculator, it will get harder. Then it'll reset for the grid ends and get harder through the grid ends. Then it'll reset for calculator, get harder through the multiple choice, then reset for the grid ends, get harder through the grid ends. This is again what the test maker thinks is hard. That's not necessarily going to be true for you. Right. Um, but what that generally means is that earlier in the math section, we probably want to undershoot our checkpoints. We want to be going maybe a little faster. So maybe we want to try to get eight questions done in eight minutes on the no calculator. Right. Or seven questions done in seven minutes on the calculator. And that just gives us some extra minutes for later on when the questions are supposed to be more complicated. Another thing that we can do to adjust checkpoints is think about passages. So for instance, on the reading, we're going to talk about the different reading passage types later in this lesson. And what you're going to find is that different passage types can take longer. Now, some things are going to be consistent between different students. For instance, paired passages typically take longer, right? That's just the way it is um, for pretty much every student. But you're also going to find that maybe personally, you take longer with certain passage types. So maybe you are not a fan of historical documents. Those take you longer. 
that's okay. Maybe you want to set a longer checkpoint for those and then try to undershoot maybe on something like literary narrative so that you have more time to give to that passage type that takes you longer. So this is just a way that if you have a little bit more time, you can adjust to make these checkpoints more realistic to you and just better. <laughs> so use these checkpoints as a guideline that you can adjust to your own skill set. Okay, now that we've got this multi-question timing checkpoint strategy out of the way, let's learn a little bit more. Let's talk SAT scoring. So SAT scoring, again, if you've taken this test, you might be familiar with this, but you also might not because this is maybe kind of opaque to a lot of students. So reading and writing, I call each of these sections, but technically they're not sections, they're tests whatever, doesn't matter. But reading and writing together is scored out of 800. Now, the way that that score comes about is that reading is scored out of 40 and writing is scored out of 40. Um, I'll talk about how they get to that score out of 40 in a second, but they score those tests out of 40 and then they add them together to get a score out of 80 and then they multiply by 10 and that gives the reading and writing score out of 800. Very cool. So what that means is that reading and writing are equally weighted in that reading and writing score. The math section is scored out of 800. Now, again, when I say math section, I mean both calculator and no calculator, but this works a little bit differently. Instead of separately scoring calculator and no calculator, what they're going to do is instead they're going to bring those two together. Right. So they're going to add up all the number of questions that you've got right across no calculator and calculator. And then that's going to turn into your score out of 800. So they're not equally balanced. Each question in math, whether it's calculator, no calculator, grid and multiple choice, whatever, contributes the same amount to that score out of 800. So then they take the reading score and the writing score out of 800 and the math score out of 800, add them together, and that gives you that score out of 1600. And that's the score that we care about, right? That's the one that's kind of the big number that colleges look at. The essay was scored separately out of eight. That's not relevant to you anymore. So we're gonna skip past that. That total score out of 1600 is the primary thing that matters. Um, so if you were taking the essay, not super important. They also give you a bunch of like little sub scores about like, well, this type of question went this way. That doesn't really matter. <laughs> Colleges, for the most part, do not care about it. That 1600 is the most important thing. Ideally, our score is going to be balanced between sections and between test scores. So ideally, your reading and writing scores are similar. Ideally, your reading and writing score is similar to your math score just to show that you are well rounded. Um, but again, that number out of 1600 is going to be the best. Now, I mentioned that I was gonna talk about how those scores come about, right? So how do they get those numbers out of 40 and out of 800? Well, like I mentioned with math, they take all of the math questions, add together the number you got right, and then they're just gonna basically put that into a little matrix <laughs> and pop out your score um, out of 800. And what that means is that within the math section, every single question has the same weight. So whether it's a hard question or an easy question, a grid in or a multiple choice calculator or no calculator, every question contributes the same amount. Same thing within the reading section, no matter what passage type it's on, no matter what question type it is, same contribution to your score out of 40. They add up the number of questions you got right, plug it into some little calculator and it spits out a score out of 40. All right, same thing with writing, all of the questions, easy ones, the hard ones, the long ones, the short ones, all worth the same number of points to your score. So what does that mean for us? If every question within a section or within a test is worth the same number of points? Skip time consuming questions. I have a question for you in the chat. Who here considers themselves a perfectionist? Who here thinks maybe I, <laughs> I'm a little too focused on perception, maybe perfection. When I get to a problem, I hold on to it because I really want to get it right. Who feels that way? And it's okay if the answer is no. <laughs> but I want to know how we feel. <laughs> it 
you can also answer in the poll, me or not I. All right, so some folks not struggling with perfectionism. That's great, that's awesome, congratulations. If that is you, you might not struggle with this strategy. You might be okay with a letting go of a question, moving on. For those of you who do struggle with per perfectionism, which is looking like 71% right now, I'm with you. It's hard, right? Especially when you've got a question, you're like, I know I can get it, right? I want to prove to myself, to the graders, to my colleges that I can get this question right. They don't care. They don't care which questions you get right. They care about your score, right? So even if you are on a question, you're going, I know I can get this right. If that question is going to take you longer than it should, if it's going to put you behind time, if it's a question that even if you invest a lot of time, you're likely to get wrong, skip it, skip it, move on, circle it in your book, come back to it later and do questions that you are more likely to get right in a reasonable amount of time. Let's talk about how we apply this. So, oops, do not open the news. All right, hopefully that's gonna go away. Okay, tips, use skipping to get back on track. So if you are at a checkpoint and you are behind time, right? Significantly, like two or more minutes. Okay, a really great way to get back on track by the next checkpoint is to skip, right? To go, um, okay, I'm going to look for questions that I don't think I'm going to get right. Maybe it's a concept you struggled with earlier, or maybe it's a question you start and then you're going, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> or this is taking way too long. Circle it, skip it, move on, come back later. And that's going to help you by the next checkpoint to be right on time. So use skipping as a way to get back on track for time to keep yourself from digging a hole. Mark the question and write down any progress. So if you are going to skip a question, in an ideal world, we're going to come back to it, right? That's that's the goal. So make sure that you circle it. I recommend on your bubble sheet, just like lightly, lightly marking it there. Um, on my test day, I think it was the ACT, but when I took my test, I skipped a question and then I bubbled the next question in on the question I skipped. And then I went like 20 questions before I realized what I did. And then I had to, erase my bubbled in answers um, and do it all over again. All right. That's bad. You don't want to do that. So learn from me, mark the question enough that you're not accidentally going to bubble in the wrong answer and have to do that. So learn from my mistakes, mark the questions and come back to it later. Similarly, write down any progress. So if this is a problem you started and then partway through you decided like, Oh, no, not worth my time right? Um, this is going to take way too long. This is going to put me behind, behind schedule. Write down any progress you've already made. So if you've started an equation or you've done some work, make sure that's there. If you've eliminated some other answer choices, cross those off. If you have to guess later, raises your chances. That's a sneak preview of what's coming. Um, so mark it, write down your progress. Now I've got some questions. What if you run out of time before you get back to the question that you skipped? We're going to talk about that in a second. That's a really great question. Elizabeth. Save time to answer or guess at the end of the section. So ideally, ideally, um, we are going to get to come back at the end of the section. Maybe that question was going to take us a while, but we end up doing questions that go really, really fast. And we have time to come back and fully solve later. That's awesome. Because sometimes when we come back later, we have like a perfect um, clarity on the problem. We have a, a different ability to process it. Great. Cool. Um, and then we can answer it there. Awesome. But if you do not, if you do not have time to actually answer it, at least save time to bubble in a guess. We're going to talk about why that's so important in a second, but we are going to have an answer for every single question, even if it is a guess. So even like 30 seconds, even a minute at the end is going to really, really help us. Know which questions to skip. Um, so this is going to be something that's going to be personal, right? So there are going to be some question and passage types that you know in advance take longer for you, right? So if you go into your reading section, it always starts with literary narrative. If you know that takes you forever, maybe just preemptively jump past it and do a different, a different passage, right? To make sure that you are on time. 
similarly in math, maybe you know for a fact that when you have questions that deal with um, exponent rules or imaginary numbers, right? You're going, nope, not for me. Uh, that, that takes me forever and it always confuses me. Just skip it for now, come back later. Again, worth the same number of points as any other question. Do the ones that you can get quickly. Come back for those, even if you have to guess. That's okay. And then stay flexible, right? Oftentimes um, when I tell folks that a math section tends to get harder through the section, they're really, really hesitant to skip early in the section because they go, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be easy, right? Again, it's personal, right? Maybe the last question is gonna be cake for you because you just studied it, or maybe that's one of your strengths. And the first, the first question just for some reason isn't clicking. That's okay, right? Maybe when you come back later, it'll be easier. Skip it for now, come back later, be flexible. All right, so skip time-consuming questions. Um, I really recommend practicing this on your practice tests in any timed chunks of questions that you're doing just so you get comfortable so that you feel confident doing this on test day because this is a game-changing strategy. It is something the best test takers do. Everybody does this. <laughs> no matter what your score goal is, you should be doing this. So don't take this as a sign of weakness. This is a sign of strength to skip questions that are going to take you longer and that you're more likely to get wrong. Okay. Let's talk SAT question structure. So most SAT questions are multiple choice. Most of them. Um, what does that mean? So in reading, writing, and math calculator and no calculator, multiple choice. There are going to be four answers, A, B, C, and D, always. Now, math griddens uh, are going to have a lot more answer choices because we have a lot of things that we can bubble in. There's like a lot, <laughs> a lot of answer choices for math griddens. Now, there is only one answer choice that's going to be correct for every single problem. Only one. Um, so what does that mean? So that means for reading, writing, and math multiple choice you have a 25% chance of guessing right or a one fourth chance of guessing right. That's amazing. That's really, really good. For math grittens, you don't have that. <laughs> For math grittens, you have a very low chance of guessing right. Now, I, I saw this in the chat earlier um, and, and someone is, is totally right. Someone says there's no penalty for wrong answers. And I forget who said that. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, well, I can't find it. Uh, oh, it was Chung Hao. Okay, so there is no penalty for wrong answers. You are absolutely right, Chung Hao. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we leave a question totally blank, we get zero points. It does not contribute to our, our score. If we put in B and the answer was A, we get zero points and it does not contribute to our score. It is the exact same thing. So what does that mean? How can we bring that information together that there's only one right answer out of four answer choices on almost all questions and we cannot get a penalty for wrong answers? You might've guessed this from our last slide. We wanna guess. <laughs> we want to guess if we are not totally sure of the answer. Even if we are guessing blindly, that gives us a chance of getting the right answer, a pretty good chance. And even if we get it wrong, okay, it's the exact same thing as leaving it blank. So if we leave it blank, we have a 0% chance of getting points. If we put in an answer for the multiple choice, we have a 25% chance of getting a point. So it's great. We love guessing. And particularly, we love guessing with process of elimination. So if there is anything we can do to go, I can rule out even one answer choice that's gonna raise our chances of getting a point. So let's talk tips. Eliminate as many answer choices as possible, even if it's only one. So sometimes process of elimination is a valid way of solving, right? We can eliminate three answer choices and the last one is correct. Amazing, pick it, you're done, you win, you got the problem right. Um, but even if we eliminate one answer choice on a multiple choice, now we have a third of a chance of guessing right, 33.3333%. Amazing. If we eliminate two, we've got a 50% chance of guessing right, half and half. That's amazing. So we're going to eliminate as many answer choices as possible, even if it's only one, it raises our chances. 
Now, if we can eliminate all of the answer choices, except for the correct one, we did it, we solved. That's something that we can do throughout the section because that is a valid method of solving and being totally sure of our answer. However, if you're going, okay, I eliminated A and D and I'm between B and C and I don't know, do not guess yet. All right, save that for the end of the section because it could just so happen that at the end of the section, you have time to come back and actually do that problem and actually get the right answer. Cool. And if you already bubbled it in, you're going to have to go find it, race it. Blah, blah. So save like the actual guess, the, the blind random guess for the end. Cool. Um, if you happen to run out of time completely at the end, even a blind random guess with no process of elimination, 25% chance. So still something we should do. Now, if we do have time for process of elimination, either during the section, because we're trying to solve that way, or at the end, because we have a little bit of time to guess, but we don't know how to like solve the right way, we're going to think about the answer choices logically. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to look at the answer choices and go, which ones cannot be right? So for instance, um, in the math section, we might not know how to solve, but we might go, I know that the answer is going to be divisible by three. I know that. Okay, eliminate the answers that aren't divisible by three. Cool, maybe we're going, okay, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna have a pie in it. Eliminate any answers that don't have a pie in it. Maybe you're not sure, but you're going, it should not be more than a thousand. Eliminate answers that are bigger than a thousand. Boom, 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 boom. And then we're good, cool. So which ones cannot be right? You can use logic to get there. And then this one, this one's kind of fun. This is kind of um, uh, almost a, a, a sub bullet of the previous one. When in doubt, pick the boring answer. And this is especially useful on something like reading or writing. Um, and the idea here is that um, the SAT is not super exciting, right? It's not going to be super um, uh thought provoking. It's not going to be super controversial. It's not going to be super angry or excited or devastated, right? It's not going to do that. This test is not exciting. <laughs> it is boring on purpose. So what you're going to do here is you are going to instead pick the answer that feels the most like the test, which is boring. We're going to try that in a second. If you're not entirely sure what that means, we'll see that in a sec. But let's go ahead and try a question where we can use process of elimination to solve. Oh, guess we're going to see it in a second, <laughs> because first I want to talk about Gridens. Um, process of elimination and guessing works really, really, really well for multiple choice, but for Gridens, not so great, right? Because there are so many answer choices. So what does that mean for us? Well, we actually had um, a pretty good, good question about that in the chat just a second ago um, that I saw. Uh, Shear says, should we start with the Gridens in the math section so we don't run out of time and have less chance of guessing correctly? Great question. Um, I typically don't recommend starting there because um, I often find that the Gridens can take more time because we have fewer strategies. Um, and I would rather you get to the questions in multiple choice that are easier, where you have more strategies that you're more likely to get done faster um, at the beginning and, and just raise your chances of getting to all the questions. That said, you are gonna want to stick to and if possible, get ahead of your checkpoints on math so that you have enough time to give those grid ends a fair shake. So do I recommend starting there? Probably not, um, just because they tend to take longer, but I do recommend making sure you have enough time to try them. And if you're going, hey, um, I don't have time to give these a fair shake, guess, but your likelihood of getting them right is pretty, pretty low. So don't spend a ton of time on it. Focus on something else. Okay. Now let's try a question. So this is a math question. Um, and it's not maybe like a super, super, super hard math question. So if you're going, I know exactly how to solve this, that's fine, but we're not gonna do that right now <laughs> because there is actually a way to solve this in like 10 seconds without actually solving. So let's read this together. In the Antares Corporation, three sevenths of the managers are female. If there are 42 female managers, how many managers in total are there? Now, like I said, we can set this up algebraically, but if we're trying to set this up algebraically, maybe that's not our skill set. Maybe we don't do great with word problems and maybe we're going, 
uh, do I take three sevenths of 42? Do I take three sevenths of something else? And then do I, do I, do I add 42? Do I take 42 divided by three sevenths? What, what do I do? Um, if you are in that boat, or maybe you just don't have time. You do not have time to think. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to try another method. Okay, so let me see, can I annotate? Yes, we are looking for how many managers in total. Okay, now let's think about this logically. Instead of doing math, let's think about this logically and see if we can do some process of elimination. So I'm gonna just draw a line and that's gonna represent my total number of managers, the thing that I'm solving for. Now I know of these total number of managers, three sevenths right here are female. Okay, what does that mean about the managers who are not female? If three sevenths of the managers are female, what does that mean about the managers who are not female in the chat? Anyone? Cool. Okay. I'm starting to get some numbers in. Ooh, Stuart. Nice. You're thinking ahead. You're one step ahead of us, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> we've got some other folks as well. Yeah. So the thing that I want to take away here is if three sevens are female, four sevens are going to be not female. Right? Okay. Awesome. Now let's bring in this other piece of information that we have 42 female managers. So what does that mean about the not female managers? Well, Stuart got this earlier, um, but we go, hey, if there are three sevenths female managers and four sevenths not female managers, that means there are more not female managers than female managers. If there are 42 female managers, there are gonna be more than 42 not female managers, which means what about the total? Well, 42 plus more than 42 means more than 84. So the answer has to be more than 84. A is not logical, B is not logical, C is not logical, it has to be B. And we're done. <laughs> All right, so what does this mean? Well, again, maybe not the hardest algebra problem in the world, and if you set it up that way, cool, you can do this one relatively quickly. However, if you think about this one logically, you can get it done in like 10 seconds without writing anything down or maybe just doing a quick little sketch like this. All right. So the correct answer here is 98 and we can get there logically. And yes, I did do this question on the ACT Live. It had one other answer choice, but it's just such a good example of this one. So this is actually a problem that would be totally um, totally realistic on the SAT or the ACT, probably a little earlier in the section. Okay, let me go ahead and get rid of these annotations because I've got actually another one for you. Okay, we have now a reading question. The author of this passage most likely believes that Ginsburg's work is some answer choice. Now you might be going, wait, this passage you didn't give me a passage. How, how am I supposed to answer this if I don't have a passage? Because we're going to use that rule about pick the boring answer. Now, even if we don't have this passage on our screen, we know what sorts of passages the SAT does, right? The SAT does passages that are relatively neutral, maybe a little positive, maybe a little bit negative, but not like super strong, not super controversial, not super mean pretty pretty in the in the safe zone right so let's go ahead and take a look at these answer choices and in the chat or if if there's a poll <laughs> go ahead and pick which answer do you think is the most boring a b c or d and if you do not know what the words mean that's a great question um ignore those and use the ones that you do know is there an answer that you think is pretty boring, maybe a little negative, maybe a little positive, but in the safe zone. Hmm. 
All right. So I'm seeing I'm seeing a few different answers in in the chat. <laughs> but I'm seeing that there is one answer that is more popular than any of the others. And um, in the poll, I'm seeing that one answer has 67% of the votes. Now, if you're going, I don't know what some of these words mean, I would recommend not picking it. Um, I would rec yet, I would recommend going through the other answer choices and doing process of elimination based on, do I think this is exciting or do I think this is like relatively safe, relatively boring? So we've got some questions on the meanings of these words. So let's go through them together. So let's start with shoddy. Um, anyone want to, if anyone wants to throw a definition of shoddy in the chat, we can, um, but I'll go ahead and give what I think of when I think of shoddy. So shoddy, I think of um shoddy craftsmanship so that's maybe where something you buy it and it like immediately falls apart right um like if you buy something off of wish maybe that might have shoddy craftsmanship maybe you think it's going to be really good and it arrives and it's falling apart or it's like way smaller than you think it's going to be it's it's not well done yeah davis that's a great, great example um chris says poor quality Baltimore dude once is poorly made. Yes, exactly. Beautiful. So it's it's not good. Um, and if I were to say, hey, this is shoddy work, that's like that's kind of mean, right? That's that's not saying like it's not the best, it's saying like this is bad. This is like really not acceptable, not up to snuff. If someone said that to me, um, if someone said this live stream was shoddy, I would like cry. <laughs> it would it would be not a good thing to say to someone. So this is not what this test is going to do, right? This test is, um, you know, it's it's not going to be exclusively positive, but it's not going to be that mean. So we're gonna, oops, uh oh, let's go back. So that's not going to be our answer. All right, so pull that one out. Okay, let's go to trifling. Let's think about trifling. And ooh, um, Lena says trifling, small amount, insignificant or shallow. Yeah, so, um, so like a trifle is something that's going to be small. It's going to be minor. Um, so when I think of uh, trifling, I think of like a, a high powered business person, right? And, um, you bring them something that's maybe important to you, but it's not important to them. They're very busy. And they go, this is trifling. Get this out of my face. Get out of my office. Right. Okay. Again, I would cry because that is a mean thing to say. So if someone was saying this person's work is trifling, they're saying it's so unimportant that it just doesn't matter. Yikes. Oof. No. Too mean for this test. Okay. Okay. Jumping to worthwhile. So worthwhile. Let's think about when we would say worthwhile. Um, we would say when we think something is like pretty good. You know, maybe it's not the most important thing in the world, but it's it's worth some time. Um, so maybe you have an opinion and someone else has a different opinion, and maybe you don't agree with them, but you're like, okay, I'm willing to I'm willing to think about it. You might go, that's that's worthwhile. It's worth thinking about. You know, it's not super positive, but it's a little positive. This is safe. This is safe for this test. Okay, I like this one. Let's leave it. Let's try futile. If C is worthwhile, futile is worth less. Pointless. Awesome, Rishab. Yeah, exactly. Um, totally pointless. Um, so an example, if there is like the world is ending, you know, people might say it's, it's futile. It's futile. It's, it's, there's no use. It's totally pointless. Don't do it. It's not worth your time. Yeah. So again, very strong, right? Whereas worthwhile is like, okay, here's neutral. It's like right here, like a little positive. Futile is like, like way negative. Not our guy. So even without doing this passage, even without reading it, there's only one answer that I think is safe that I think this passage would actually be in terms of tone and that's worthwhile. So 
even without context, which you should never do on this test. <laughs> we're probably going to be reading a little bit um, of the passage, at least, even if we're low on time. We can still look at these answers and just boom, 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 which one's the most logical. So we're going to think about the feelings or the tone of the words. Yeah, Nikki, Nikki, that's a great, great summary. Okay, nice work. So process of elimination on those two were really, really powerful for getting through it. And again, if you're going, hey, where do I learn these words? I don't, I don't know them super well. Um, again, there's no, there's no guarantee of what words are going to show up on test day. So use the words that you do know. Um, so if you do know worthwhile, you can go, hey, I know that word and I know when I would use it. And it's not super positive or super negative. That feels pretty safe to me. And if we've read this passage um, even a little bit, we probably know that it's a little bit positive. Okay. So that can help us go worthwhile, feel safe. Even if I don't know these other answer choices, I'm not going to let them like suck me in because I don't know them. All right. So we're going to take about a five minute break in just a second. But first, I want to talk about some study strategies. So how can we get the most out of our study no matter what we're doing? Oh, and there's a great shout out in, in the chat for the Magoosh vocab app. <laughs> um, vocab is not the thing that I recommend studying the most. Um, there aren't a ton of questions that are super reliant on vocabulary. And usually we can use process of elimination to get through them okay. So there are things that I recommend more, but if you're like on the bus, or like in a car, or you have like five minutes, vocab app is a really great use of your time. Okay, back to study strategies. How are we going to make the most of our study time? Number one, be consistent. Be consistent. We love consistency. Um, and kind of the opposite of consistency is cramming, right? So going, I'm not going to study for like two weeks. And then one weekend, I'm going to do like three practice tests. That's a really bad idea. Um, one, because we're not going to do very well <laughs> on those practice tests. We have a limited amount of study in us before the quality starts dropping and we start making mistakes and building bad habits. But two, during those two weeks, um, we're not doing anything to help our brain build connections and make our understanding better, right? So we need to be consistent with our study, doing study every couple of days for a reasonable amount of time so that our brain can start making connections, building on previous knowledge um, so that we can actually learn effectively. So multiple study sessions each week. I'm not saying they have to be long, right? I'd say minimum 20 minutes, maybe up to like two hours. If you're taking a practice test, like four hours. <laughs> um, but again, study multiple times each week. Um, the thing that I recommend is just putting it on the calendar and building your time around it. If you don't put it on the calendar, it's not going to happen. I know this from experience. There are a lot of things that I think would be good for me to do. And if I don't put them on the calendar, I don't do them. So I recommend putting them on the calendar. Um, similarly, if you find that you struggle with staying consistent on your own, maybe you're not entirely sure what to study, or you have just a hard time with the accountability of actually getting it done, something like a course or a study schedule can help with this by going, okay, here's maybe what you should do. Google Challenger changed my life too. Oh man, yes. <laughs> Calendar is really helpful. So of course, a study schedule can help you stay on track by going, okay, this is when these things happen. You have due dates, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so our SAT live classes, for instance, meet two times every week and have dedicated homework. So you know you're already studying two nights per week. You're probably doing homework on two to four other nights and you have a day off. All right. So be consistent. Helps your brain. Similarly, take realistic practice tests. Oh, and we also have study schedules. Those can help as well if you're self-studying, going, I don't really you know what to do. Maybe you're using our online program. You're having a hard time. We can break it down for you with study schedules for different numbers of months. Take realistic practice tests. So one of the things that you'll see in our study schedules, as well as in our course, is that practice tests are an important part of your study because taking realistic practice tests is its own thing. Because if you are only doing your study in an untimed context or in like short bursts, right? Um, you're not going to get the same experience that you have on test day, right? Um, 
on test day, you're going to be dealing with time management. You're going to be dealing with anxiety. You're going to be dealing with exhaustion, right? So you need to take some practice tests in order to make sure that you have the ability to apply those skills in the context of tests. We got a question, where should we take realistic SAT tests? That's a great question. Um, there are realistic SAT practice tests on um, the College Board website. There's like eight to 10 on there, which is a lot, um, especially when you take into account that they, you're going to be taking these tests every two to four weeks. So if your test day is closer every two weeks, if your test day is farther out every four weeks, perhaps. Um, and that's gonna make sure that you are taking them frequently enough that you get in enough before test day and that you're building on your knowledge, but also not so frequently that you end up burning out and you can't improve between practice tests. Now, if you need additional practice tests, there are some on Khan Academy for free that are really great. Um, we have a free practice test PDF on our Magoosh blog that you can use. Um, the official ones are the gold standard. If you're going to use ones that aren't official, just do your research and make sure that they're actually high quality, that they're actually realistic. Um, again, there's so many official ones <laughs> that I really recommend them. If you run out of all the free ones, different test prep companies have some that are paid. We've got um, like four for um, th that are within our um, online program. Okay, so we're going to take realistic practices in addition to our other study. And then as we study, so whether we're doing practice tests, we're doing lessons, we're doing questions, blah, 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 we are going to prioritize weaknesses and learn from our mistakes. So we're not going to drill and then go, cool, I got most of them right, and then fail. That's not good. <laughs> it's not great study because the best way to learn is to learn from your mistakes. Because if you don't learn from your mistakes, you make them again and you build bad habits. So prioritize your weaknesses. When you find that you're struggling with something, hone in on that. Spend more time on that. Don't spend time on the stuff you're doing well on, right? I don't want you to study more than you have to. Spend your study time on the things that'll get you points. And then when you make a mistake, dig in. Go, what did I do? Why did I do it? How do I recognize that in another problem? And then how do I fix it? How do I do something different? And then we got a question. How do you know the specific topics of our weaknesses? Practice tests practice tests. On your practice test, look at the questions you missed. Spend hours. <laughs> Spend as many hours reviewing your practice test as you do taking your practice test and go, what sorts of questions am I missing? Okay, am I seeing any patterns? All right. And then based on that, go, okay, let me let me spend some time with that. All right. Let me look at these individual questions, see if there's anything I can take away. And then let me practice similar questions, trying to apply those same strategies. Cool. And I know that looking at mistakes, wrong answers can be discouraging, but the thing that I want you to remember is that spending time with those will help you get fewer in the future. If you don't deal with them, they don't get better. And then you're dealing with that same thing forever and ever, and you just get into these bad habits that you have to deal with for longer. Wow. So I really recommend doing this. It, it does take a lot of thought. It takes a lot of energy, but it's how you get the most out of your study. The folks who I've seen who've done this get past plateaus, get past awful hurdles, and spend less time studying and get more out of it. So prioritize your weaknesses, learn from your mistakes. Okay. Quality over quantity is basically the big thing I'm talking about here. Make sure you're actually getting stuff out of your time and seek out expert help if you need it. If you're struggling with identifying what's going wrong, if you're struggling with consistency, if, if you need more resources, Expert help can be really, really useful, whether that's in a class, whether that's with an online course, whether that's from a book, seek out help if you're gonna need it. All right, we are gonna go ahead and take a five minute break. I'm maybe gonna run my AC a little bit, <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, now's a really great time. This is also a great time to write down that 20% live classes discount code live 2021. When we come back, we're gonna talk about reading passages, and then we're going to do our raffle. All right. See you in five minutes. So we'll be back at 5, 12 p.m. Pacific. See you then. Okay. I'm going to try running my AC. This might be an awful noise. Let me know how terrible this is in the chat. <laughs> But it is warm. <laughs> All right. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat.
you can't hear it at all. Oh my gosh. Why have I had it off this whole time? I might just leave this on. <laughs> wow. Incredible. I had no idea. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. This is, this is very helpful for the next hour of my life. Oh, can't believe it. I was suffering for nothing. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Is studying for the SAT enough for the PSAT Minish Great question? Um, yeah. They're basically the same thing. Um, the question types are identical. Um, the PSAT, so basically the big difference with the PSAT is that it's meant to be like a tiny bit easier. The, the idea behind PSAT scoring is that whatever score you get on the PSAT, if you take the PSAT in junior year, when kind of most people take the PSAT, that by the time you're taking your SAT toward the end of junior year or beginning of senior year, you will get the same score on your SAT. So studying for the SAT works for the PSAT. It's the same question type, same general stuff. Um, the one thing that I would recommend is make sure that you're familiar with the structure. It's a little bit shorter. Um, so make sure that you know the timing for that test. So your checkpoints will be different on the PSAT than they are on the SAT. Um, might be a good idea to take one PSAT practice test just to get familiar with that structure before you go in, but that's about it. Highly recommend the PSAT. It's great practice. Um, and man, if you can get a National Merit Scholarship, those are awesome. Okay. Um, How did I do on my SAT? Great question. Um, so I took the SAT when it was a little bit different. Um, so it was scored out of 2,400 and I got a 2,250, which is a 99th percentile score. I think it translates to like 15, I don't know. I'm not even gonna guess. It's a 99th percentile score. So probably something in the 1500s. Um, yeah, so I, I did pretty well um, when I took the test back in the day. I think I do, I think I do better now, <laughs> given that I've been teaching it a lot since then. Um, okay, great question from Davis. How alarming is it to have a significant gap between test scores? On my practice test, I've been scoring in the mid 600s for the reading and writing and high 700s for the math. Okay, so one, congrats on your high 700s math score. That's awesome. Um, that doesn't look like a like a wild gap to me. Um, doesn't look super, super intense. Um, that said, schools do look at specifically the reading score. Um, it's, a, it's a good indicator of freshman retention rate. So like whether or not you're gonna drop out after freshman year. Um, so they, they like that score to be high. Um, so what I would recommend for you is not the end of the world. Your score is still going to look really, really good. Um, and the fact that your math score is so awesome is going to be good for you, <laughs> especially if you're applying to like math related programs. Um, I would recommend focusing most of your study time, probably like 80% on reading and writing topics, focusing specifically on your weakest areas to try to bring that up in line um, with your math score. Um, I'd say spend like, you know, 20% of your time on math just to make sure you're staying consistent there um, and maintaining your score. Um, if it says, can we go through a reading passage later? Yes, we're going to. <laughs> okay. Um, what score should we aim for on the SAT if we're looking to apply to T20 schools? Great question. Um, my answer would be Google it. <laughs> um, those, those pieces of information are really, really publicized. What I would recommend is, um, look for these scores for admitted students and then aim for at least the average score, maybe toward like the 75th percentile score. Um, so I actually just did a, a webinar on this. Um, we, I think we're gonna post it to our YouTube channel soon, but for setting your target score, I recommend taking your school list, finding the 75th percentile scores for all of them and then averaging them to get your goal score. So that's my recommendation. Um, how are we doing on time? Ooh, we are, we are out of time. So if you had additional questions, I'm sorry, I didn't get to those right now, but I will get to those after. So if you want to hang on to your questions until after our live stream, I will answer those then, even if we have to go a little bit over. But for now, we're going to go on to SAT reading passages. Okay, 
So we're back from our break and we are going to attack SAT reading now that we've done kind of our more general discussion. Okay, so we know on SAT reading, we have 13 minutes per passage and that includes the questions, <laughs> right? So that's pretty, pretty tight on time. Um, so really what we have is 13 minutes per passage and 10 to 11 questions. So how, how do we do that? Right, we, we know that those are the checkpoints we wanna skip or that we wanna to get to. And we know that we're gonna skip if we're running out of time. We know we're gonna adjust our pace, blah, blah, blah. But how do we actually achieve getting through a passage and the questions in that amount of time? I wanna do, I wanna do a poll. And uh, Hannah, if you wanna pop that up, you don't have to write all of this in there, but if you wanna pop up a poll related to this one, I would love to hear what you do. And if you wanna answer in the chat, you can also do that there. How do you approach, oh, this says ACT reading in science. That's my mistake from copying from the other webinar. This should not say that. I approach SAT reading passages. SAT reading passages by, all right, let me make that larger. Oh, I can't. What do we do? <laughs> Apologies for this not being right. Okay, do you read every single sentence? Read the whole dang thing, word for word, and then go to the questions or to, yeah, to the questions. Do you skim the passage? So read some of it, right? Um, then go to the questions, go back as needed. Do you, and that's totally fine, yeah, and that, that works great. Do you skip straight to the questions? And I didn't correct this either, it says sipping should say skipping. Do you skip straight to the questions and then go back to the passage or do you do something else? Wow, apologize for like the million mistakes on this. Let's see how we're looking in the poll. So, so far the most popular answer is A, which is reading every sentence. Let's see. Okay, so taking a look at this poll, it seems that the most popular answer was A, read every sentence with 38% of the votes. We got B at 35% of the votes, so some people skim, C at 22% of the votes, and D at 3%. So not a lot of people do their own thing. Um, hello, Nayak. <laughs> we, can, we can see ya. Okay, so what that means for us is that a bunch of people do a bunch of different things. All right, um, one of these is gonna be a better choice than the others. Which one? So let's talk through each of these options. So let's start with reading every single sentence. Now, if you struggle with timing on SAT reading, it is likely that maybe you read every sentence and that makes sense. Um, it's something that we do in real life, right? We read every word because we wanna understand everything for this test. But the thing is, on this test, we don't need to understand everything. We just need to answer the questions, right? Um, and the questions aren't going to cover everything. There's only 10 or 11. So do we need to read every sentence? No. And two, we don't have time to read every sentence. Because often when we're reading every sentence, we get hung up on little details. They put in these sentences that are just awful, that don't matter, right? And so we end up reading them like five times, end up super focused on this thing that doesn't end up helping us. Um, and that wastes our time, right? Um, and, and it actually puts us in a bad position for other questions, right? Because if we are so focused on this one detail, we might miss other details. Or if we get asked a question about what's the point of the passage, maybe we don't know because we were so focused on one itty bitty tiny thing. So reading every sentence, even though it was the most popular answer, is not something that I recommend. Let's jump to C, all right? Because this is another strategy that a lot of people follow. They skip straight to the question. So they go, okay, I know I don't need to read every sentence. I know that that's a waste of time. I know that the test maker is going to build in sentences that are meant to confuse me and waste my time. So I'm gonna skip straight to the questions, figure out what I need and go back to the passage. And that's gonna be faster, right? You would think. However, there are 10 to 11 questions here, which isn't a bunch, 
but it's a lot, right? So if we think we can jump straight to the questions and then go back and read the whole passage and remember all of it, that's not going to work. If we skip straight to the questions and then go, I'm just going to try to find exactly the answer and never read the passage. Well, okay. If we get a question about a detail, where do we look? We don't know, right? There, there's no indication of where we should look because we don't know anything about the passage. Where do they talk about that? I don't know. So we end up reading the whole dang thing anyway, right? If we get a question about what's the purpose of the passage, how do we know? We haven't read it. <laughs> so what happens when we skip straight to the questions is we waste a bunch of time by going back and reading the passage actually like multiple times um, to, to get to the answers. And we end up missing the questions because we don't have context. We end up falling into answer traps. And let me tell you, having written these questions, the answers are built for people who skip straight to the questions. They're meant to confuse you by being things that are believable. So this isn't a good choice. So what do we do? How do we skip the, or how do we not skip the questions? How do we approach this passage in order to save time and deal with these questions and get them right? If you picked skimming, you are correct. That's actually going to be the best move. Now, if you did not pick skimming, I want you to open your mind today. I want you to join me on a journey of trying out a strategy that I find extremely effective for my students. So rather than going, I'm going to read the whole thing, including details that don't matter, or going, I'm going to avoid the passage altogether and end up missing questions and reading the whole thing anyway, what instead I'm going to do is I'm going to try to read only the important parts of the passage, the stuff that's going to help me understand the passage at a high level, and then give me enough information that if I need to find a detail later for a question, I can go back. Now, if you are going, how do I skim? I'm seeing I try to do skimming, but I failed. I don't know how to skim. Yeah, I also failed to do that. Yeah, how do we know? How do we know what's going to be important? Let's find out. Um, so first thing I want to note is that a lot of people think skim means read every single sentence really, really quickly, speed read, right? And and quickly, we're just doing the first thing. We're doing it badly. So don't do that. Um, this is going to waste your time. It's not going to help you. We don't want to read every single sentence. What we want to do is we want to read only important sentences and skip everything else. Just totally don't read other sentences. But Erica, how do we know what sentences are important? There are clues. There are going to be clues that a sentence is important and we should read it. So, oops. here's a question. If I asked you to write an essay, all right, um, and you can just answer this one in the chat. If I asked you to write an essay, but I didn't want to read it, that would be really rude. But let's say I did it. Um, and I want to know what your essay is about by reading as little as possible of your essay. What paragraphs would you tell me to read from your essay to get the gist, the big idea in the chat? What paragraphs will help me get the big idea, the gist of your essay without reading the other ones? Cool. Cool. Okay. So I'm seeing some folks are voting for the body paragraphs. And while the body paragraphs have a lot of good information in them, they don't give me the big picture. The big picture, and this is kind of the most popular, is the introduction and the conclusion. Because the introduction is going to say, here's what we're going to talk about here. It's the big idea. The last paragraph is going to give us the conclusion. It's going to say, here's the takeaway. Here's the take home message. Here was the point. So if you are really low on time on the reading section, just read the first and last paragraphs. That's it. Because what that's going to do is it's going to give you big ideas. So like that question about do we think uh, Ginsburg's work is whatever word, we would be able to answer that based on the first and last paragraphs. No problem. We would be able to tell that. If they ask us, what's the purpose of the passage? We got it. What's the tone of the passage? We got it. Um, what would the author think about this? We got it. 
Okay. So first and last paragraph is going to help us get the big ideas, which will help us answer a lot of questions. Okay. Now let's say we have more time because that's, that's not what we want to do. Ideally, let's say I have a little more time. Let's say I am going, okay, I want to read a little more of your essay. If I wanted to get the big idea of a paragraph in your essay, what sentences should I read in the chat? What sentences of a paragraph should I read just to get the gist of that paragraph? And again, this is not a trick question. It's the first and last sentences once again. And most importantly, the first sentence, because the first sentence of a paragraph in any well-written essay is going to introduce what that paragraph is talking about. So if we read just the first sentence of a paragraph, now we know what that paragraph is doing. And if we have a question like, what is the main idea of paragraph four? We got it. What is the purpose of passage four? We got it. All right. So first and last paragraphs, we should read them. And then first and last sentences of paragraphs, we should read them particularly first. All right. Last sometimes is a conclusion, sometimes not. We might skip that one, but first sentences of paragraphs if we have time. Okay. Let's say we have a little more time, a little more time. And I want to find important sentences within paragraphs, particularly within body paragraphs. There are certain words that often show up at the beginning of sentences that can tell me whether or not a sentence is important. Does anyone think they know a type of word that I might see near the beginning of sentences that can tell me whether a sentence is important or not? I don't even think they know in the chat and not everybody gets this or if you think you've got an example of a word that we might see Ooh, chris i like always never um that's actually coming up in a later bullet Oh, Surya, I'm going to answer the question about comparing passages in, in um, a few slides. Ooh, okay. Um, Hannah's saying, therefore. That is an amazing example of a transition word. Lena's got this one. Transition words are extremely powerful for reading passages. Yeah. Um, transition words tell us what a sentence is doing. Is it contrasting? Is it concluding? Is it doing cause and effect? Is it doing more information? Is it doing a detail? Is it doing an example? Is it doing a list? And based on what a sentence is doing, we can tell whether it's important. So there are certain transition words that say, I'm important and you should read me. And the two big ones are contrast and conclusion. So let's talk contrast words. Um, throw some examples of contrast words in the chat. What are some contrast transition words that if we see them, we go, I'm important and I should read this. Um, I see a really good one already. Yeah. So EK says, however, if says, however, uh, Froxenberry says, however, uh, Stuart says, however, Chris says, however, Vignesh says, however, um, Gregory says, but yeah, okay, I'm seeing a lot of these. So any sort of thing that says, hey, let me switch gears, but however, on the other hand, that's contrast. All right, if we are switching gears, we should read that conversely. Yeah, love that. Um, Felipe, that's great. As opposed, Lena, that's awesome. Uh, nevertheless, Sumaida, that's great. Yes, yes. So if we see contrast, that's important, we should read that. And the reason why, um, if anyone's ever been given a bad apology before, where someone goes like, I'm sorry, but, like, I'm sorry, but I actually think this, or I'm sorry, but I, blah, blah, blah. They're not really sorry. It's the stuff after the but that they really feel. That's a bad apology because it's got a but. The stuff after that 
contrast is what really matters. It is the same thing on SAT passages. So if they go blah, 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 blah. However, the stuff after the however matters more. Read that, skip the stuff before. Similarly, conclusion. I got a really great example of a, a conclusion word already with therefore. If anyone has other conclusion words, go ahead and throw those in the chat. Um, but just coming up with some examples off the top of my head. Um, therefore, in conclusion, Druva, that one's great. Um, as a result, thus. Uh, those are the sorts of words that say this is the point, right? This is what we were leading toward in the end, right? So they're often cause and effect E. They're the big point. If they give you that indication that this is the point, you should absolutely read it. Ultimately, that one's great. Yeah. So if you see contrast or conclusion, read that sentence. Okay. Now, we had an example earlier. Oh, and who said that? I forget. But uh, someone in here that I shouted out earlier um, gave examples of always, never, none. Those are tone words. Remember how we said that these passages are usually boring? They are. If they give you anything that's like a little bit spicy, we want to read that. We want to note, okay, what is it saying that about? Who feels that way? Because that's kind of uncommon for this test. So if you get something like exciting or um, devastating, I'm probably not going to see anything quite like that. Um, worthwhile, um, unfortunately, or extreme words like all, always, never, none. Maybe take a peek at that. If you see any tone words, anything that is stronger, we should pay attention to that. We might not read the whole sentence. We should note who feels it about what. Now, a couple of folks in here put in a bunch of transition words, which were transition words, but they're actually transition words that we would not read, wouldn't do it. So some examples, detail. If we see detailed transition words, we should not read that because that's not important. It's a detail, right? It's something that we might get asked about, but it's something that we can come back later to when we have a good idea for the whole passage. So for instance, if it asks me about a detail, I can go, I know that's in paragraph four because I got, I read the first sentence of paragraph four and then I can go hunt it down. So let's give some examples of detail transition words. In the chat, give me some detail transition words. Um, and it, we've got a great question. Is she to unrelated, but aren't answer choices that you have always or never usually wrong? Yes, that fits into pick the boring answer. If you have something that's extreme, always, never, none, probably not the right answer, but yes, absolutely. You can use that for process of elimination. I'm trying to see if I've gotten some detailed transition words already in here. Like, mm -hmm, specifically, for example, is the big one. Um, Anna has that one. Um, yeah, if we have, for example, to illustrate first, second, third, fourth, those are details. Those are little ideas. Do not read those. Don't do it. You can come back for them later because you already have the big idea that it's an example of. You'll know where to look if it's asking about them. Don't read it. Now, a lot of the things that I'm getting in the chat are actually continuation, um, which is here's more information, right? Maybe at the same level of importance, but just here's more. So moreover, mm -hmm. um, additionally, in addition, um, similarly, um, furthermore, also, yeah, those are words that say here's more of the same. Don't read that. You already know the big idea. You don't need more of the same. You can come back for it later. If you need it for a question, skip it for now. And that's it. So these are our clues for what are we going to read in order to effectively skim and what are we going to skip? Now, there's going to be a little bit of follow your heart in here, right? So sometimes I'm going to look at the last sentence of a paragraph and I'm going to go, that's not important. I'm going to skip it. Sometimes I'm going to look at it. Maybe it's got like a however on the front of it and I'm going to go, yes, I'm going to read that. Sometimes I'm going to see a however, but I'm going to see that the however is part of an example. 
okay because it's part of an example. I'm not going to read it. So there's a little bit of judgment that goes into this, right? Just like there's judgment with the checkpoints, but these rules are going to help give you the foundation to skim effectively. Okay, and we're going to try this in just a second, but I've got some more strategies for you. Strategy number two, summarize as you go. So um, in the chat, has anyone had the experience of you're reading something and your eyes somehow go from the top of the page to the bottom of the page, but you don't remember anything that you just read? Like you clearly read it, your eyes read it, but you cannot remember what you read. You have no idea. Who's done that in the chat? As I know. I have. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing some me's. Yes, definitely many times. Yeah, okay, yes. All right, so this is really, 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 really common. We want to avoid that, especially on test day. Right, because on test day, that is a massive waste of time and it's not gonna set us up to answer these questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put ourselves in a position where we're not going to do that, right? We're gonna make sure that we are paying attention as we read to what we're reading, making sure that we understand what we're reading. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna summarize as we go. So how do we do that? We're gonna summarize in chunks. So usually these chunks are going to be a paragraph, right? So after we read a paragraph or actually skim a paragraph, after we skim that paragraph, we're gonna stop. Before we keep going, we're gonna go, what did I just read? What does that mean? And we're going to come up with, okay, what was the big idea? What was the purpose? What was the main idea? Is there any big tone? Is there any big structure? We're gonna come up with that before we go on to the next paragraph. And that's gonna be a check that we're paying attention right? And that we're actually understanding. So we don't get to the end of the passage and then um, <laughs> not know what it was about. But what we're also going to do is we're going to jot this down in margins. So right next to the paragraph, we're going to go, boop, 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 boop. what is my summary? Okay. And what that's going to do, one is it's going to keep us honest. I know there's a bunch of things where I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that, but I'm not really, right? Unless I actually write it down somewhere. So we're going to write it down to keep ourselves honest. But two, we're going to do that so that when we go to the questions and they go, what was the point of paragraph four? We can look at our summary and we have that. Or we're going, oh, here's this detail. Where is it? Let me look at my summaries and my summaries will tell me where they are. Or if I'm going, what's the purpose of the passage? I don't know. Maybe I'll look at my first and last paragraph summaries and that's the purpose of the passage. Boom. It's this incredible reference that doesn't take that much time. So we're going to jot down our summaries in the margin. Now, if our summaries are very long, that actually will take a bunch of time which is why we're going to keep our summaries really short. We're going to keep them less than or equal to five words. One that's going to make them easier to write down. But two, it's going to make sure that our summaries are actually focused on the big ideas. Oftentimes when I'm like, okay, summarize this, we end up just like saying the whole paragraph, right? That's not a summary. And if we're answering a question about what's the purpose of paragraph four, it's going to be short. So we want to keep a brief summary that really hits the, the, the high level ideas to make sure that we understand the point, the big idea, not get into the little details. So I've been saying this a lot in your summary, we're going to focus on big ideas, structure and tone. We're going to avoid little things like like details that hopefully we didn't even read. So let's give some examples of what that might look like. Um, I, but before we do that, um, when I say big ideas, structure and tone, the most important thing is relationships. Um, and this is going to be really, really important when we get into natural science, which is where we're, we're dealing with um, plants, right? Oftentimes people are like, well, I have to define all the technical terms in my summaries. No, don't do that. That's not important. What you want to deal with is the relationship. So, okay, maybe I don't know what this theory is, but this paragraph tells me that scientist one came up with the theory, scientist two did not like it. And then discovery A helped prove scientist one's theory. That's what belongs in our summaries. That's important. That's something that's gonna get asked about. The little details don't matter. We can come back to them later. 
So don't get wigged out by weird stuff. We're actually going to try this in our example passage. So let's do some examples of what a good summary is. So this is a summary that would be really awesome for like a first paragraph. Global warming, frowny face, but solution. Now that's awesome because this gives us so much information. One, this passage is about global warming. Global warming is bad. Tone, but tone shifting to positive, there is potentially a solution. If I had to guess what was coming in the next paragraph, I'm going to bet it's the solution. So now I know what's coming in the rest of this paragraph. And if I was really low on time, I could just be done and move on to the questions. We love this. OK, what if we have a less important paragraph, like one that says, to set up the experiment, first we did this, and then we did that, and then afterwards we did blah, blah, blah. That's not important. I would not read like any of that. I would read half of the first sentence. And then my summary would be experimental methods. So if they ask me about my experimental methods later, I can go back and find it because I know where it is, but I don't have to read all the details right now. So summaries for less important paragraphs can be really, really brief and mostly just a reference. If they ask me for the purpose of the paragraph, it's to give the methods. If they ask me about the methods, I can go look in that paragraph. And sometimes our summary is two arrows up. Because sometimes a paragraph starts with additionally. <laughs> and it continues from ideas in the previous paragraph. OK, great. The summary is the same. Doesn't matter. All right. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel with these summaries. We want to focus on the big ideas, the structure, the tone, the purpose. We're going to practice this in a second. But one more thing. You might be going. But Erica, if I skip sentences, just like full on skip sentences, and my summaries are five words long, how am I going to answer the specific questions? I get that I can answer the purpose of the passage. I get that I can answer the main idea of paragraph two. I get that I can answer how the author feels about this. But how do I answer specific questions about stuff that I didn't read? Keep it skimming. Because yes, there are going to be questions that ask about stuff that you did not skim but you can still answer them really fast. How? Keyword skimming. Okay, what does that mean? We are going to look at the question. We are going to find the weirdest word in that question, all right? Um, and the weirdest word basically relative to the passage. So if the passage is about dinosaurs, dinosaur is not a weird word. However, if the passage is about dinosaurs and we see like petroleum, and we know petroleum only comes up in one paragraph or we've never seen it before, that's the weirdest word. That's my keyword, targeting. Okay. Then I'm going to look at my summaries and I'm going to go, okay, based on my weird word, what summary is most closely related to that weird word? Sometimes my weird word will show up in a summary. So if I see petroleum in any of my summaries, that's the paragraph my answer's in. <laughs> Laser focus. If I don't see petroleum in any of my summaries, I might go, okay, well, petroleum is a natural resource. Okay. What paragraph is about natural resources? Oh, there it is. That's it, zoom, okay? And yes, SG Evans says, so you should read the first and last sentence of each paragraph to know which paragraphs to pay more attention to. Yes, so that's what's gonna tell us what to put in our summary, right? What's the big idea of the pass it or the paragraph? And then with our keyword skimming, we can go, which paragraph is this keyword idea in? Okay, so now we've got the paragraph my keyword is in. From there, maybe we're able to answer the question. Amazing. But if not, we're going to go, OK, I'm going to look for the shape of that word. What does that mean? Rather than reading the whole dang paragraph again, I'm going to look for the shape of the word that I want. So for instance, let's say my word is petroleum. Can I make that larger? Yes. Let's say my word is petroleum, OK? When I see the word petroleum, I see that the P sticks down. I see that the T sticks up, the L sticks up, and it ends with this weird lumpy M. And I see that the word is about this long. I can look for that shape in the paragraph without actually reading. And then when I go, okay, all right, I see a word that's about this long that starts with a sticking down and ends with a lumpy and has two sticky uppies in the middle. It's petroleum. That's the sentence with my answer in it. 
I read that sentence. I've got my answer. I answer the question. Done. Incredible. I read one sentence in order to answer this question. I couldn't have done that without my skim. So even if we do not skim the actual answer to a question, our skim helps us find it. Now, sometimes we end up with a question that asks about a word that never shows up in the paragraphs. Okay, annoying. Then we have to use synonyms and maybe we have to get a little bit more in depth, maybe read a couple of sentences within a paragraph, but we should always be able to hone in on one, maybe two sentences. So yeah, that, that's the idea, Tyra. What, how about paraphrase words? Okay, we should still be able to find a paragraph. And then within that paragraph, maybe we go, okay, that idea is in the second half of the paragraph. Maybe I have to read two sentences. Oh, but it's two instead of one. So it's not that bad. So shape of the word there, meaning if we do see the literal word, so petroleum, I'm looking for something that looks kind of like this, right? It sticks down at the beginning, is kind of lumpy at the end. So that's the petroleum, there's the T, there's the L, and it's about this long. Does that make sense? The shape of the word. So we're not actually reading, we're just looking for about this long down won't be okay all right now we're not going to try that today because we're not actually doing questions today that's in lesson three in the live classes series but i just want to show you this as a strategy because it helps prove why skimming is really really useful okay so we're going to look is this a long word is this a short word? So should I be looking for spaces that are this far apart or this far apart? Which letters stick up, which letters stick down? And that's gonna help us locate that word more easily. So does it start with a capital C? Okay, I'm gonna look for a capital C, et cetera. Okay. Now, before we try this, I wanna look at passage types. Now for all of these passage types, we're gonna do the exact same thing. We are going to do skimming. We are going to do summaries. We are going to do keyword skimming for specific questions. But these different passage types are, are different, right? So we want to be prepared for all of them. So let's talk through the four different passage types that we can see on test day. So the first passage is always going to be literary narrative. Um, so literary narrative is fiction, right? It's a, it's a story. Um, so this might be an excerpt from a novel. It might be the, an excerpt from a short story. Um, it's a story. Um, so sometimes it'll have a narrator, sometimes it'll be in first person, sometimes it'll be in third person. These are often maybe a little more comfortable for um, folks to read because these are the sorts of things that we read in English class that we've been reading since we were kids. Um, however, sometimes they don't have great paragraph structures. Sometimes they can be a little bit harder to apply our skimming strategies to. So that's literary narrative. Historical document. So I, I've seen this one crop up in the chat a couple of times. Um, historical document, these are typically the ones that have maybe older language. So they're things from like the founding of America or, you know, um, important historical events or landmark court cases. Um, so very often they'll deal with like abolition, they'll deal with suffrage. Um, so important things from US and world history. These typically have really solid paragraph structures, which is nice. Um, they're rhetorical, meaning they're often an argument, um, which can mean that they have a little more tone to them. That's great, that can help us skim, um, but they often have fancier English because they tend to be a little bit older. So that can create a bit of a challenge where sometimes the sentences themselves are harder to read. Maybe we can tell which ones are important, but they're, 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 they're hard to read once we can tell they're important. Okay. That's those two. We have social science. So social science is going to be topics that are about social stuff. Um, so these are not hard sciences. These are what we consider our soft sciences. So these are going to be things um, like psychology, sociology, economics, um, things that have to do with how we live in a society, right? Um, these have beautiful paragraph structures. Awesome. Um, I find that they can be kind of variable, like whether or not I know the topic or feel comfortable with it can, can kind of depend. Um, a lot of people like these. Um, 
especially in comparison to the last one, which is a natural science. <laughs> um, so natural science, I'm laughing at Newton and Shakespeare, two nightmares. So this is uh, the, the Newton nightmare. Um, natural science is where we deal with our hard sciences. So that's things like, <laughs> like biology, like chemistry, like astronomy, geology, um, the technical stuff, right? Um, these have beautiful paragraph structures, like the best of all of them. Really great paragraphs, really easy to skim. However, they tend to be technical. Now, as we know, the technical stuff doesn't matter. We care about the relationships. We can kind of ignore all of the details. That said, a lot of people still get nervous on these because they are technical, because they're scary to look at. So those are our four. We're going to come back to this in just a second. Now, of these four, we're going to have two of either social science or natural science. It's going to depend on your test day. So you might get lucky, <laughs> you might not, depending on your personal preferences. Now, one passage on your test day is going to have graphics, all right? So that might be a graph or a chart, a map, I guess you could have um, some sort of graphic representation. That is going to be on either social science or natural science, whichever one you have two of. So if you've got two social sciences, one will have a graphic. If you have two natural sciences, one will have a graphic. And then one passage is actually a pair of two short passages. So we had the idea of a comparison passage pop up in the chat earlier. That's this. So actually, sneakily, it's six passages. But um, instead of one long passage, it's two shorter passages. We're still going to have like 10 or 11 questions. It's just some will be on passage one, some will be on passage two, some will be on both. Um, recommendation for this, this is actually something I do in a later lesson, but I'm going to tell you now, read the first passage, do the questions on the first passage, read the second passage, do the questions on the second passage, then do the shared passage questions. They always go in that order. So they start with passage one, then passage two, then the shared ones. So skim only the stuff that's relevant for the first few questions. When you hit a passage two question, go back, skim passage two, and then go from there. It can help with keeping them straight. I, I might have been confusing when I said wait so when I said six passages. There are actually five. There are five passages, but one of those passages is two short passages. So that I've never seen it on literary narrative. I have seen it on historical documents. So it's actually two historical documents that typically disagree. Um, I've seen it on social science. I've seen it on natural science. You won't know until testing. Okay, I've got another poll for you. Which passage type is your least favorite? Literary narrative, historical documents, social science, or natural science? You can answer this one in the chat, or if Ken wants to pop up a poll, we could answer there. Um, but I want to know which one do you like the least? Maybe one that takes you longer, that you do worse on, or just you don't like it. <laughs> Let me know. I'm seeing in all of them. <laughs> That's okay. That you can definitely feel that way. Interesting. I'm seeing, I'm seeing some division in the chat. Um, we, we've got a poll up. So if you want to answer in there. So it definitely seems like the, the least favorite is historical document. Um, that's, that's pretty common um, that folks don't like historical document. I wish that was our example today. Um, but the other one that I think I'm seeing most commonly is natural science. But some folks actually really like the science, which is great. We're going to be doing a natural science passage today. So if it makes you nervous, these technical ones, that's what we're going to try together. But I do recommend in your own study practicing all of these, making sure you feel more comfortable with them. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't give all of them as an option. I should have next time. Um, but also know which ones are your weaker areas so that you can just skip those. So if you did not like literary narrative that wasn't, that wasn't your favorite, skip it and do whatever the next one is, come to literary narrative last. If historical document is your least favorite, do it last. All right. Okay. Um, you might also make a judgment call on historical document based on when it was written. If it was written in the 80s, maybe do it. If it was written earlier, maybe skip it, come back later. Okay. 
we are going to try this with a natural sciences passage. And if you're going, how in the world are we gonna do this in seven minutes? Don't worry, we're gonna be fine. Okay, so this is a natural science passage from the SAT. We are going to start with the first paragraph. Now, because this is the first paragraph, we are allowed to read the whole thing. There are some pieces in here that aren't super important, so you can skip over some of this if you want, but I would like you to read what you think is right from this paragraph. And then in the chat, I would like you to give me a five word or fewer summary of this paragraph. What is it about? Give it a shot on your own and then we'll try it together. Take about a minute. Ooh, I'm not seeing that it's blurry on my end. If it is too blurry for you, um, Ken, would you do me a favor and link the PDF of the SAT paper practice test? I think it's, it, oh, it actually might not be in there. Ignore me, Never mind. <laughs> Yeah, I would recommend just refreshing on your end um, to see if you can get it clear. All right, five or fewer word summary of what this paragraph is about. Ooh, I'm seeing some beautiful ones in the chat. Take about like 15 more seconds. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing beautiful summaries in the chat. So good. Let's go ahead and skim this together um, to figure out if there's anything that we can skip and how we get to some of these really beautiful summaries. So if I were to read this, I would actually skip some of it, but I would read most of it. Okay. First sentence, the farther we reach toward the stars, the more questions we discover about our home. Okay. This was the first sentence of the paragraph, but it was fluff. Sometimes the first sentence of the first paragraph is like a hook. Okay, so it wasn't really a good topic sentence. I'm going to keep reading, but that was, that was fluff, not important. While scientists have proposed many theories about the origin of the moon, origin of the moon, this feels important, many theories about it. Deeper investigation into other planetary bodies has complicated each hypothesis. Does anyone see a tone word in that sentence? A word that says, I'm important, I'm the tone. There's a strong tone word in that sentence we just read. Anyone think they see it? Yeah, complicated. Yeah, we also have this while, which is kind of a contrast as well. So we're going, ooh, okay. So there, there are a bunch of theories about the origin of the moon, but they're complicated, right? None of these are perfect. Ooh, okay, all right, tone. Maybe we're gonna dig into this. Okay, at this time, there are three major, kind of a tone word, important. There are three big important theories that still exist to explain how earth obtained its, its satellite okay the moon each theory attempts to explain several factors blah, 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 blah. okay i don't really care the theories are trying to explain the moon's origin whatever recent investigation into samples from the moon and other terrestrial bodies have complicated once again each of those three theories. Okay, so we've got this tone of this is, this is, none of these are perfect, but there are three. So summary here, I saw some really beautiful ones. So I'm gonna uh, scroll back up and, and see some of the ones that I really, really like. You weigh three major theories about moon. I would maybe do like moon origin, love that. Um, origin of the moon, I would maybe add three theories um tree moon origin formation theories beautiful i would maybe add that there's three major ones 
Um, theories on the moon, I would maybe mention um, origin, Hannah, but that's really, really good. Mashia says, uh, there are three major theories on the origin of the moon. So good, a little bit long, but those are all the big ideas. Um, Davis, origin, moon equals confusing, three theories. So good. That's very close to what I would do. That's, that's really awesome. Theories of moon origin, uh, origins of the moon, questions about the moon, origin moon, theories on how Earth obtains satellite. I would say specifically the moon is the satellite. Moon origin, moon origin, moon origin. Beautiful. So good. <laughs> so what I would do here is I would go, and, and there are more. I just can't get all of them. So here I would do a summary that's something like um, three moon origin theories, but complicated. And that's it. That's maybe not the best color for this. Three moon origin theories, but complicated. Okay, before we go on to our next paragraph, let's predict. What do you think our next several paragraphs are going to be about? And in fact, actually better question, how do you think this passage is going to divide up its paragraphs? How do we think this passage is going to break up the paragraphs based on our summary of this one? In the chat. Hopefully that question makes sense. Bignesh says theories. Felipe says the three major theories. Iman says comparing the theories. E says each theory. Alexander details about the theories. Shrabani elaborating on each theory, each of the three theories, each theory, blah, 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 blah. Yes, absolutely. They introduce the fact that there are three major theories. We are probably going to have a paragraph for each theory. And Stuart says, what are the complications? UA says, what are the complications? Yes. So I'm going to guess that there's going to be a paragraph for each theory and that each paragraph is going to dig into the complications. Now I know we're at time but watch this. I'm going to do something kind of fancy here. I'm going, I think I know what each paragraph is doing. I'm going to look at the first sentence of the body paragraphs. Body paragraph one, the leading moon origin theory has been the giant impact hypothesis. Holy smokes. The first paragraph is about my first theory, which is the giant impact hypothesis. I should have typed that. Giant impact hypothesis. And I'm actually, I'm going to clear that and type it. So I know that my first body paragraph is about G-I-H. Okay, great. I don't need to read any more about that. If I have any questions about giant impact hypothesis, I'm going to the first paragraph. Boom. Okay, moving on to the second paragraph. Although support for the giant impact hypothesis was weakened by this isotopic evidence, okay, Hypothesis, scientists now seek to refine the hypothesis, oh, to take the new information into account. This is also about the giant impact hypothesis. Okay, so this paragraph is building on the first one. That's okay, it's the leading theory. It makes sense that it would have two paragraphs. I'm betting this next one's about the second theory. As much challenge as the findings regarding isotopes pose for the giant impact hypothesis, they provide even more problems for another leading theory. This is the second theory. They don't tell me the name. I bet you anything, if I read the second sentence, it would tell me the name. Maybe I'll read the second sentence of this paragraph, but not right now. If they ask me about the second theory, I know it's in that paragraph. Last body paragraph, the remaining major theory, the fission theory has no challenge explaining the isotopic similarity of the earth and moon. Third, fission theory. If I have a question about the fission theory, I'm gonna go to this paragraph and I'm done. Okay, so if I wanted to go in and find more details from these paragraphs, I could, absolutely, I could read more, but if I wanted to just be done and skip to the conclusion right now, I absolutely could, because I have a great idea for the structure of what's going on. I also have good information on the fact that the first hypothesis was weakened by isotopic evidence. I know that the second theory was also had problems with these isotopes, but the third theory actually has no problem with these isotopes. 
So I know that the isotope is a complication for the first two. I don't know what an isotope is, but that's okay. But isotopes are actually fine for the fission theory. I got so much out of reading four sentences. So if I have questions on the big ideas, I've got it. If I've got questions on details, I can find them. I'm gonna skip to the conclusion and be done. So look at all this that I skip. Boom, 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 boom. All of that, I skip it. I don't read it because I don't need it. And then I can read the last paragraph. In light of the difficulties new discoveries has presented to old hypotheses, it is important to remember that contrary evidence benefits any scientific theory. Oh my gosh. Is that my conclusion? Let me read the last sentence. As astronomers learn more about the isotopic signatures of various planets in our solar system and beyond, theories of the moon's origin are not damaged but improved. Oh my gosh, that is tone and that's the takeaway. Complications equals for moon origin. that's it. Now, if you're going, okay, I get it. I've got the big ideas, but how do I answer the questions? I'm going to recommend that you join us in our live classes if you can, because we dig into this for two more hours on reading questions. So we take this exact passage and we go through questions and how to answer them based on this skim. Now, if you cannot join us for live classes, I have a video on how to um, answer reading questions, uh, specifically the biggest reading question strategy that I have on our YouTube channel, and I recommend checking that out. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and wrap this sucker up. So final takeaways, test structure, timing, and scoring lead to test strategy. We are going to use checkpoints, we are going to skip questions, and we are going to guess with process of elimination. We are going to focus on study quality over study quantity. So we are going to be consistent. We are going to take practice tests and we are going to address our mistakes, prioritize learning. And we know that SAT reading passages are not like reading in real life. So we are going to do an initial skim. We are going to summarize as we go. And when we get to questions that we can't answer, we're gonna keyword skim until we get to the one sentence that gives us the answer. And that's it. So if you have questions, now is the time. If you would like to take down our 20% live classes discount code, if you wanna join us for reading questions and a bunch of other stuff, live 2021. You can use that for ACT or SAT live classes, either one. And we can do the raffle. Oh, Ken's got it in the chat. I'm probably behind. It's probably been announced already. <laughs> Who is it? Did we already put it in the chat? Did I miss it? <laughs> no, okay, it's still coming in. Oh my gosh, Lena! Lena Zhu! That's awesome. So if you are the winner of our live class, let Ken know in the chat. Ken says, please email me at hien at magoosh.com to claim your free live class package. So Lena, go ahead and email hien at magoosh.com to claim your free live class. So excited. Um, if you did not win, <laughs> you can still join us. This 20% off code is live 2021. We would love to have you in these classes for 14 more hours of live classes content. Now, if you cannot join us for live classes, you're looking for something a little bit more self-study, you can go to our website. We have an online program that can help you with your self-study. If you can't join us, we have a blog, we have a YouTube channel full of some awesome free resources. So if you are self-studying, we can still support you. All right. 
If you're headed out, see you later. Thanks for being here. If you'd like to stick around and ask me questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat. If you had some questions over the break that I didn't get to, add those to the chat again, and I'm happy to stick around and answer some of those. If not, see you later. Oh, we got some questions on pricing. So um, our live classes um, package is $3.99, but with the 20% discount, that's a fifth off. I'm going to calculate it. I've done too much thinking. <laughs> Times 0.8. That's going to be $319.20. Um, so it is a really good deal for what it is. Um, if you look at what other... Uh, test prep companies are charging for live classes. They're offering fewer hours for a lot more money. So this is the best deal on live classes on the market, I think. Um, we really did our best to make it a, a good deal. Um, and the, the lessons are very much like this one, but they get more into depth with more specific topics. Um, if you are interested in our online program, the pricing there is $129, um, so a little bit less. Um, it's not going to be live, um, but there are lessons and explanations and questions and video explanations, text explanations, a lot of really great content. So that can help if you're just trying to figure out what to study, but you're able to study that on your own. Cool. Okay. Oh, um, I see a really great question. Um, I got around a 1550 on my practice test, but a 1310 on my actual SAT. Should I be concerned? Amazing question. Um, so Raul, um, my big suggestion there is to make sure that your practice tests are really realistic. Um, sometimes I find that students don't do as well on their actual test day if, um, if they end up taking their practice tests like in multiple sittings, right? Like maybe they take one section one day and another section another day or maybe they don't time it super accurately or they take it like really comfortable like sitting in their bed or um they take a little break for a snack or something like that like make sure that it is or or if their practice tests are not realistic so maybe they got it from a test prep company that doesn't produce really awesome practice tests that can happen and then you can get a different score on test day so my big recommendation is make sure your practice tests are realistic the other thing that i'm going to recommend is making sure that when you're taking your practice test as realistically as possible, you're trying to recreate the conditions of test day. So like early in the morning at a desk, um, the sort of situation that's hopefully going to create the same feelings that you're going to feel on test day. So you want to be, you want to feel that time stress. You want to feel that sort of testing anxiety that you feel on test day. You want to feel exhausted and, and dealing with that because those are things you are going to deal with on test day. And they're the sort of things that can lower your score on test day if you haven't practiced them. So practicing them in advance is going to help you do better on test day, but it's also going to make sure that your practice test scores are realistic. So it's distinctly possible that your practice test scores are realistic and you can achieve them once you practice that test day situation a little bit more. It's possible that your practice test scores are not realistic and that your test day score is more realistic. In any case, taking practice tests, I'd recommend every like two weeks is going to help you achieve the same score on your practice tests as on test day. Okay, I got some other questions in here. Let me scroll up. I'm so glad folks enjoyed this. Yay. <laughs> okay, let me see. What else have we got? Um, are there going to be other live classes or is this the only free one? Don't know. I recommend subscribing to our channel to stay updated um, with, with what we end up putting out. Okay, what else have we got? When's our next live SAT class? Similar question. Not entirely sure, but hopefully soon. These are fun. Okay, question. After taking a baseline practice test, should you first study the section you did worse on? I did worse on math than on reading, so should I start to study math first? I recommend not studying just one thing at once, but I recommend prioritizing one thing. So I would recommend if you did significantly worse on math than reading, maybe spending like 75, 80% of your time on math and 20, 25% on reading 
or writing, right? So studying a little bit of everything, but prioritizing the thing that was weaker. Um, if you did a little bit worse on math and on reading, maybe a smaller split. So maybe like 60, 40, 60% 60 math, 40% reading and writing. Um, and just kind of judge based on how different those scores are. But I don't recommend completely leaving off the other sections because that can mean that your score ends up dropping in those sections while it improves on the sections that you worked on. And that's not great. So do a little bit of everything. Prioritize the stuff that's weaker. Okay. What else have we got? And that was that was Gregory. Hope that hope that helps. Um, what else? Is it possible to in increase my score by 300 plus points by August? Realistically, I would not expect that. Um, we have some guidelines on about how many points of improvement you can expect um, in different amounts of months. Um, if you're looking for somewhere in kind of like the 100 to 200 range, like potentially that's achievable in a month. Um, two months, maybe something in the in the 200 range, um, maybe 300, maybe. But that's going to be kind of pushing it. If you're looking for something like more significant, that's probably going to take longer. Now, this is also going to be dependent on your on on your baseline. Like, did you just start? If you just started, it's more likely you're going to be able to get more points as you're learning like things about timing and just general strategy. Those tend to increase your score pretty quickly. If you're already deeper into your study, then it's probably going to be a little more slow going. If your score is lower, it's likely to go faster. If your score is higher, probably not going to go as fast. So unclear. I think that's a reach. I would recommend having a very regimented study schedule, not like a million hours a week, but like set aside the time now, plan when you're going to take your practice test now, maybe get help on making sure that you're focusing your energy on the right stuff just to get the most out of your time. Okay. What else have we got? <laughs> How often do you recommend someone studies daily? Um, okay, I think that's kind of two questions. So how often do I recommend studying like how many days per week? I would recommend at least three, at most six. I don't recommend studying every day, take a day off. Um, but I recommend studying at least three days a week um, to make sure that you're giving your brain the materials it needs to build connections and you're not letting your brain break down between study sessions. Um, in terms of how long to study in one day, we typically recommend trying to do like 10 hours of study in a week. Um, that's if you're, if you're like on the path to your test day. Um, so if you're doing like five study sessions a week, that would be like two hours a day, which is pretty intense. Um, if you've got a practice test that week, that would be like four hours for the practice test. And then you're splitting up the other six hours throughout the week. Um, now you might not be able to achieve that. Um, in the which case I would aim for at least five hours per week. So breaking that up between however many study sessions you're, you're doing that week. Um, I would not recommend going any higher than like, definitely not higher than 20 hours per week. That's something you could maybe do in summer if you've got like nothing else going on. Um, but any higher than that, you're just going to end up, um, not performing well and missing questions and building bad habits. So don't. Um, but in terms of how long should a study session be, a practice test should be your longest one. That's four hours. Um, reviewing a practice test, I recommend taking like two days, two hours a pop to review. Um, a normal study session, you can do shorter ones, like 20 minutes. Um, to maybe like review mistakes or do like vocab or something. Um, but your typical study session, I would recommend somewhere in the realm of one to two hours. Hopefully that helps. Okay, um, my highest SAT is 110 with math, the high score. Do I have time to make a 1250 on the August test? That actually feels, well, okay, actually. So it's two, two, 240 point improvement. Again, it's gonna depend. Like that feels maybe more realistic. That feels in the zone. But again, you're going to have to have like a, the, the same advice that I gave earlier. Plan your study schedule now. Aim for 10 hours a week. Um, break down when you're going to take your practice test, et cetera, et cetera. Really plan that. And then potentially, again, get assistance to make sure that you're focusing on the stuff 
that you are weakest on, making sure that you're improving. Um, something like life classes could be useful for you or maybe a tutor um, or even, even just making sure that you have materials to study. Um, to focus on those weaknesses. So if you know that you're not stronger in geometry, that you have resources on geometry to study. So maybe, <laughs> um, yeah, but, but plan, because that's, that's significant. Um, oh, uh, how many hours a day would be unproductive? Yeah, um, so again, it's probably gonna depend. Um, for a study session that is not a practice test, I typically don't recommend going farther, much farther over like, two hours, three hours. Um, but what I would recommend is be realistic with yourself. If you are making mistakes that you shouldn't be making, stop working, walk away. Maybe you can come back later, but make sure that you are getting good study, right? Quality over quantity, walk away if it's hurting you, because if you're building bad habits, it's not good. It is actively hurting your score and chest day. So make a judgment call, but yeah, they're at a, at a few hours, you're heading into too much <laughs> territory, unless it's a practice test. Okay, what else have we got? Mm, don't study only math or reading. I did only English and it decreased my math score. Yep, I fell into that trap too in high school. Yeah, study a little bit of everything. Um, okay, ma'am, since I'm a senior and I have yet to take the SAT, ACT, do you think I should go for the earliest test dates possible or should I wait until I'm ready? Ooh, great question. If you haven't taken the test yet and you're a senior, I would recommend, if you can, plan to take two. Take one now to get a score and then take one later when you're more prepared. Um, what we really don't wanna happen is that you don't have time to take your tests. That really sucks. Um, that, yeah, that can really mess up your plans. Um, if, you, if, you can, if you can manage to take two, I would recommend just taking one to get the score so you can at least apply and then try to retake. Um, that first test can actually tell you a lot about how you're performing. Um, it's statistically proven that folks who retake tend to do better on that retake. That is the thing that we see for students. Um, so if you can, I would really recommend that. Um, definitely don't put yourself in a position where you run out of time. Okay. Um, question I haven't studied at all. How do I build a rigid study schedule? I'm new. Um, I would recommend checking out our study schedules on our blog. I can link to those earlier, but if you just Google Magoosh SAT study schedule, um, you should find those. Um, but the big thing that I would recommend is put time on the calendar. Um, that just helps make sure that you actually will do it. <laughs> and, then, and then I recommend putting the practice part, like I don't, I don't usually have like, okay, I'm just gonna sit down for four hours. Like I have to put that on the calendar. Um, so plan when you're going to take those. I recommend taking your last one the week before your test day and then space out two to four weeks before that. Okay, got a few more. When do you suggest I take my SAT if I'm a rising junior? Um, again, if you can take two, two is the best. Um, if you can take your test before the end of junior year or over the summer, before your senior year, it is awesome to have it done before senior year, just because you've got so much going on senior year with doing senior year, but also with applications to college and like enjoying your life. Um, yeah, if you can get it done before senior year, I recommend it just for like your mental and emotional health. Um, but um, what I would recommend is maybe then again, just leave the option open for yourself that if you don't do as well as you would like in, in maybe toward the end of your junior year, um, that you can take it again, maybe early in your senior year to improve. Okay, how much time should I study every day to be ready for the SAT, which is in October? Don't study every day. <laughs> but I would recommend maybe aiming for five to 10 hours per week. Um, a thing that I would recommend is take a practice test now compare it to your goal score, see how much you want to improve, and then go to our blog and then compare to going, um, okay, based on my point improvement, about how many months is that going to take? And we give guidelines of like, should this take one month? Should this take like three months? Should this take like um, six to six months to a year? Um, and, and, and use that to kind of go, how long do I need? Um, my recommendation would be aim for 10 hours per week. Okay. Is it possible to go from a 780 to a 1300 in two months? 
that one I'm going to say unlikely. Um, that said, if you've got a 780, that to me indicates that maybe you're not finishing a lot of questions um, or you're guessing on a lot. Your timing strategy can help you a lot with improving that. So lock in your timing strategy like now. Um, work on those checkpoints. That's, that could really do a lot for you. I've seen getting timing boost scores by like, especially scores that that are maybe like in the in the 700s, 800 zone, bump scores by a lot really fast. So if timing strategy is an issue for you, do those checkpoints. Practice skipping questions that can help you a lot and guessing. Okay. Um, oh, we've got the test dates in the chat. What else have we got? Blah, 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 blah. How do I study for the SAT? Um, we had a, a little bit on that earlier. <laughs> um, so if you want to go back and watch the recording, um, if you're struggling with studying for the SAT on your own, I really recommend something like an online program um, just to give you materials um, or potentially um, like a live class. But I also have um, I have a webinar on our YouTube channel about how to get the most out of a short SAT study timeline. I would recommend watching that. That can really, really help um, because it, it, it's basically catered to that question. How do, how do I study, especially if I have less time? I recommend checking that out. Uh, is it possible to go from a 940 to a 1380? Again, it's, it's possible, but yeah, it really depends on your timeline. Um, I would recommend, again, focusing on timing strategy. I would bet that maybe that's, that's a, a challenge there. Um, that can really do a lot for you. Um, so yeah, everything's possible. But, um, it just depends on your time. Um, is two to four hours per day all right? Um, be careful, that's getting a little long um, in terms of study. So if you find that you're missing questions you shouldn't be missing, walk away. It is better to study less and study good than study bad and study more. Um, I'm not getting good reading comprehensions to exercise on online. Um, again, there are free practice tests from College Board. Um, there's also some good free stuff from Khan Academy. Um, we've got some free stuff on our blog, um, but if you are looking for additional practice, I'd recommend something maybe paid like our online program. Um, you can also buy like um, official materials um, from College Board um, with additional practice. Um, but yeah, at a certain point, you do run out of free materials that are available. Um, Magush is a cost-effective option um, with, a, with a lot of practice in it. So that might be something that I would recommend. Okay. Do, 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 do. I think that's it. Okay, we are going to call it. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. We are done. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, you can leave those in the comments on this live stream when it goes up and someone will come in and answer those. Um, hopefully we see you in our live classes. If we don't see you in the live classes, we hopefully might see you in our online uh, program. And if we don't see you either of those places, we hope to see you on YouTube and on our blog. Thanks so much for being here. I'll see you later. Bye.